of their pecking increased after a few days of pecking. At first they missed the beak a lot and later they hit it almost every time. So they were learning that. But that's an innate behavior. That's something that the chicks are born with. Animals are also born with what are called fixed action patterns. This is the fixed action pattern of a goose. The goose will respond to the stimulus of the egg rolling out of the nest. So if an egg rolls out of the nest, the goose goes through a behavior pattern. It will automatically go to the egg and roll it with its bill back into the nest. And they show that here. B, the goose begins to roll the egg. The goose rolls the egg back to the nest with the underside of its bill. The goose continues to roll the egg until it is in the nest. If you do experiments with these uh, geese, where instead of a, an egg, it's a ping pong ball that rolls out, they'll do that with the ping pong ball too. They automatically go through that behavior. Yeah, and they never have to see another goose do it. They automatically do it. It's called a fixed action pattern. Even if it's not their egg? Even if it's not their egg, that's correct. Even if they fit in a bird's egg? Exactly. <laughs> they'll do it with anything. Anything that looks, that even resembles an egg. I had a question. Yes. Say you're playing golf. They would do it with a golf You skull ball. one. It runs through their nest and leaves. Will they chase it down 100 yards and bring it Well, back? I don't know how, how far they would do it, but if it was close by, they'd He's roll it back. So we call that a fixed action pattern. Something, something that you're born with knowing how to do, and you will go through the, this action, and it can be a long involved action, but you'll go through it without ever having to learn it. You're born with it. That's an innate behavior. Habituation. The decrease in an animal's response after repeatedly being exposed to a stimulus that has no positive or negative effects. At first, when you put the scarecrow up, the birds are afraid of it. But if they fly by every day and see the scarecrow and get closer to closer to it and realize it's not doing anything, they get used to it. That's habituation. So you want to change the jacket and the hat of your scarecrow every now and then to keep the birds so they don't get used to it. Habituation is getting used to it. If you take a wild horse and you take it into the city, as soon as it hears a horn honk or sees a car or sees all these people, it's going to be scared. But after a while, it gets used to those sounds. As long as you keep them exposed to the sounds, they, they realize that it's not that bad, and they get used to them, and they start to ignore them. That's habituation. 
Absolutely. Yes. Being with horses, uh, when we first came here, since we had like six horses, we had to get them used to everything. And one time I was riding my horse in a mail truck, like a mail car or something. It was driving down the street and it honked the horn. And my ho I was in the ring with my horse and my horse did not like the sound and he went berserk. And I'm just like, did he throw you off? No, I stayed on. Thank the Lord, I was on my yeah. saddle. If I was on another saddle, I would have gone. Now, have you noticed him getting used to it? Has it ever happened again? He sees the car, he's just like, yeah. Like, I'm just that's, that's the situation. Where did you move from? From Aiken. And Aiken, we oh, barely have any cars because yeah. they're like, <laughs> what's in South, South Carolina? Carolina? Yeah, so, wait. South Carolina. It's a city in South Carolina. There are clay roads, and the people there, like, they know that there are horses around. Here, no idea. When I drive by that now, every single time. Okay, conditioning. Y'all, I gotta keep going here. Yes, because you said that. You may have heard of Pavlov's dogs before. Pavlov was a scientist who studied a phenomenon called conditioning. It's, kind, it's, it's a form of um, learned behavior. Learned behavior is, uh, and habituation was another form of learned behavior. Learned behaviors, you, uh, it, you have to see some things. It takes some time. It takes some brain power. Habituation takes some brain power. The animals get used to something. They learn that the scarecrow is not going to do anything to them. Well. Conditioning is an example of very simple learning. What Pavlov did was he would place um, a bowl of food in front of a dog and the dog would salivate. Saliva would come out of his drool. drool. It would drool. And he actually had little containers that would catch the drool so he could measure it. He was a scientist that studied saliva. What kind of dog is he I don't know what kind of dogs he used. That's a good question. Now, Later, what he would do is every time he would present the food bowl, he would ring a bell. So the dog gets food bowl, bell. Ring, ring, every time the food comes out. And he would salivate when he'd see the food and he'd hear the bell. Then, after a while, after doing that several times, the dog has learned that bell ringing means food. And so if you just ring the bell without presenting the food, he'll salivate. Because he's used to the bell being presented at the same time with the food. So the dog has learned bell means food. And that's a simple form of learning that's called conditioning. Yes? When I lived in Maine, one of my friends had a bell right by their back door. And like they would ring the bell. And that meant like they were going to take the dog out to the bathroom. And the dog would just go up and sit and pick up. Exactly. The dog learns that the bell means out. Yes. That's exactly like the door when we go home. We open the door and it makes like this ringing noise. I'm Sergeant Bertha, and they just go up to the door and start barking. And they just figure out who it is. They're like, okay. You ever run the can opener and your cat runs up if you have a cat? Because they used to that sound means food. I hate cats. Whoa, what is that? Oh my god. Every time we talk about cats. This is a little tube. Listen. This is a little tube that's hooked up to the salivary gland and it measures the amount of saliva that comes out of the dog. So this was a scientist that actually measured this stuff. And there's the dog, and that's Pavlov, Which one? and that's a cup oh, poor Pavlov. Uh, on the dog's salivary glands that would capture the saliva. Mm -hmm. mm. That's a wife. I don't know who that is. Ugh. Probably the mistress. Poor mistress. <laughs> now, in operant conditioning, listen. In classical conditioning, we just present something like a bell with the food, and it learns that bell means food. But in operant conditioning, you associate things and you use rewards and punishments to, uh, to either increase a response or decrease a response. For example, when a bird eats a butterfly that tastes bad, it associates the color of the butterfly with the bad taste and avoids all butterflies of that color. So if you associate rewards or punishments with behaviors, you can increase a behavior or decrease a behavior.
For instance, dog comes and begs at the table. If you give him food, he's going to beg again. If you slap him on the head, he's probably not going to come to beg again. So it, it depends upon, the, the conditioning depends upon the reward or the punishment. You may have heard about uh, Skinner's experiments with rats. Could you hurry up and finish that? Either do it fast or don't do it. I'll send it Okay. Uh, they had Skinner was a was a psychologist, and if you if you're interested in this stuff, take psychology in the future. He put rats in a cage, and in the cage he'd have a lever, and the rat would press a lever, and food would come out. So he's getting a reward for pressing the lever. So guess what he does a lot? Press the lever. Presses the lever. And then Skinner would make it where he had to press it twice to get food to come out. And then Skinner would make it where he had to press it three times. And then five times. And then ten times. And, and Skinner would teach the rat tricks. He would make it where he had to press it. And then he wouldn't give him food until he pressed it. And maybe the mice turns around. Now the mice just turns around by accident. Presses it and turns around by accident once. And sees the food comes out. But then the mouse goes, hey, if I press it and turn around, maybe food will come out again. And Skinner would make it come out when he pressed it and turned around. And so Skinner would teach animals all these tricks by rewarding them with food, and we still do that today. It's called operant conditioning. That's how you train these things. Oh, I thought I had video footage. You do. It's up on the floor. It's not working. Video footage here. Animal behavior is innate or learned. Fixed action pattern behavior is innate because it is genetically based and it is not linked to past experience. Habituation and operant conditioning are learned behaviors because each results from situations that the animal experiences. This newly hatched cuckoo is carrying out a fixed action pattern. An adult female cuckoo lays her eggs in the nests of other bird species. When the cuckoo hatches, it ejects the other eggs from the nest before its eyes are even open. The process of ejection is an innate behavior known as a fixed action pattern. Habituation is a decrease in an animal's response after repeatedly being exposed to a stimulus. These birds have become habituated to the scarecrow. Although they might have avoided it when it was first placed in the field, they learned that there were no positive or negative effects associated with it. In operant conditioning, an animal learns to associate its response to a stimulus with the reward or a punishment. These ducks have learned to associate the presence of humans near the edge of the pond with the reward of food. Huh. Now there's another type of very simple learning that we call imprinting. Baby Chicks, baby ducks, will follow around, or geese, I don't know what this is, I guess it's a duck. Baby ducks will follow around any object that is near them that is moving when they hatch. Now, we call this imprinting, and almost always it's the mother, because the mother sits on the eggs and the babies hatch. But scientists found out early on, if it's a scientist that's around when the eggs hatch, the goose or the duck will imprint on the scientist. And the duck will not follow around its mother even if shown its mother later. It'll follow around the scientist. And until it's big enough to get food on its own. And the guy who did most of the experimenting with imprinting was named Conrad Lorenz. And that's him. And there's the geese, a bunch of Canadian geese, following him around. And he was, he was around when, when they hatched. He found out that they would even follow around, if he, if he was in a side room and had a red ball connected to a string, and when they hatched, if he moved the red ball around, they would follow around the red ball, and not their mother, even if they're showing their mother later. So, these things have a, have a, like a, they're born with a tendency to imprint on anything that they see that's would, moving around. Would they follow even if they didn't, uh... Weren't getting food, yeah. No one can tell these imprinted baby geese that Conrad Lorenz is not Mother Goose. Isn't that strange? So that's another form of learned behavior, 
imprinting. It's, it's kind of a combination of learned and inborn. Uh, finally, we have cognitive behavior. Cognitive behavior involves thinking and reasoning, processing information. Um, if you're sitting, if you're sitting in algebra and you're solving a problem, that's cognitive behavior. Making decisions, planning for the future. What are you going to do after school today? You can sit there and think about it. You don't actually have to do it. You can think about what you're going to do and solve any problems. Oh, I need to make sure to get my ride so I can go to the movie. And I don't need somebody to pick me up from that. That's all cognitive behavior, thinking about things. And then we have a lot of organisms have cognitive behavior where they think about stuff. And there's been a lot of research on primates that I'll show you some videos of. This is a group of chimpanzees that were all taught sign language. Is that Jane Goodall? And they could, no, that's not Jane Goodall. They actually like have oh, And they could talk to the people. Was it like really simple stuff though? Like, just, what would they say? Some of them could speak up in 300 words. They would say, I'm hungry, I want food. They would say, I like your pretty dress. They would say, let me out of this cage, please. Really? Oh, yeah. It's like that's so awesome. 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 <laughs> okay, that was 31.1. I'm also going to do 31.2, which is tomorrow night's reading, because, again, I'm not going to be here tomorrow, but you'll watch a video tomorrow about all this, all these That's behaviors. Right. <laughs> uh, yes. Wait, 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 wait. Who's, uh, who's some of yours? Not Miss Swanson, right? Heineke. Yes. He's so nice. Yes, no, I hate Miss Swanson. All right. Agonistic behavior. The word agonistic means means mean, means fighting. If, if two organisms are fighting with one another, that's agonistic behavior. Thank you, And organisms will do this for various reasons. They'll do it over mate. They'll do it over uh, a food source. They'll do it um, to improve their level in a hierarchy, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, a lot of times it does not involve an injury. Usually the organisms will kind of size each other up. The, uh, the baboon with the biggest teeth, probably nobody's going to end up fighting him, but they'll, be, you know, they'll have a standoff and they'll both show their teeth and the one with the smaller teeth will go, oh, I didn't realize that he was that mean, I'll just leave him alone. And so they kind of fight with one another in this way without actually hurting one another. I know I have video footage. These vultures are using their naturally broad wings to intimidate. The flight feathers hang in a curve on its outstretched wings and exaggerate the bird's bulk, making it seem more threatening. Will mate with that one if they can, if he'll if he'll let them. 
and sometimes the male doesn't let them, so they'll go is to that, the next male in the ranking. But the one at the very bottom hardly ever gets to mate. Uh, it's, but you can move up by fighting. And what usually happens is the older you are, the bigger you get, the more you've eaten, more and, and, the, and the healthier you are, and then you fight your way up. Yes? Is the fact that the strongest one gets to mate the most, is that just by design to get better... Yeah, if you have bad genes, if you have something wrong with you, some mutations and stuff, you're probably not going to be able to fight your way up to the top. So it keeps the group having good genes. Yeah, exactly. Dominance hierarchies. Territorial behaviors. A lot of animals are territor have territoriality. And here's how territoriality works. Let's say we have a big area of forest, okay? Deer show ter territoriality. Um, would you want all your deer, let's say this is a, a thousand acres of forest, would you want all your deer in just one location? What would be bad about that for the deer? Not enough food. Not enough food in that one location for all these deer to eat. Predators could get to them easier. Also, disease spreads very easily, Bennett. Disease spreads very easily if you're real closely packed together. So, I want you all to pay attention. So, the problem is, if you're too close together, there's a lot of difficulties. So, organisms are born with what's called a territoriality. They, they feel crowded if they're too close together. And they will naturally spread out. And they will spread out where their population is kind of evenly dispersed through the forest. That means there's enough food for everyone. There's enough mates for everyone. Predators can't destroy the population easily. And you're not going to have much disease. Well, let's say a couple new ones are born and they have to go somewhere. Well, they might be, a couple new ones are born here, they're too close together, they'll want to spread out, but they might have to move into somebody else's territory, and that somebody else might not like that. So then you run into some of this ag agonistic behavior that we talked about before, where they're fighting and such for territory. Like hippos fighting. Yeah, hippos do the same thing. They open their mouths real wide. How do they know, like, if they go somewhere new, how do they know it's not another deer's territory already? They have a way of patrolling their territory. A lot of them pee on the, on the bushes and stuff to mark their territory. A lot of them have calls. If, if, if they call out, like birds and stuff will call, will make calls. And if, and if you move into the territory, you'll be able to hear their call and you'll go, wait, I'm a little too close to that one. I'll move away. Rod and scrapes on trees. Scraping on trees, yes. Very good. Yeah, Pro, why is it? The top I mean, left picture, the handlers are out of the picture. Me, so. I don't know. It's just the way they made that. <laughs> Watch a little territoriality here. This strange resident of the Star Garden has an even stranger name. It's called a sarcastic fringe head. And this one is looking for a new home. It prefers the security of a den to being exposed out on the sand flat. This abandoned shell is perfect. Unfortunately, this rock is already home to another fringe head. And sarcastic fringe heads make poor neighbors, especially when both neighbors are males. If the newcomer is going to keep his home, he'll have to fight for it.
man's head with the biggest mouth and the most aggressive display usually wins. Probably the one on the left. Eventually one of them will leave. If he doesn't, then there'll be a fight. But the smaller one can usually say, okay, if this comes down to a fight, I'm going to lose. So they'll get away before they actually fight. Because if they do fight, somebody's going to get hurt. Easier to probably find another territory than to risk getting injured. Okay, you might have heard of foraging behavior. Foraging means finding food. And if you ever watch a squirrel run around finding acorns and such, that's foraging behavior. Foraging means successfully obtaining needed nutrients while avoiding predators and poisonous foods. Much of an animal's time is spent foraging for food. Humans are one of the lucky organisms that has plenty of food. There's very few organisms like that. Maybe some cows and stuff that are fed. But most organisms spend most of their time having to find food. With our technology and agriculture, we don't have to do that very much. Doesn't spend much of your day doing that. Migratory behavior. Migratory behavior is moving from one place to another. There's different migrations. There's land migrations where organisms like caribou, if you've ever heard of those, big moose-like um, hooved mammals that live up in the north, they'll migrate from one part of Canada all the way across to another, or one part of Russia all the way across to the other, looking for food. But most migrations you hear about are bird migrations. They can go very far. Some birds go from North America, up in Alaska, all the way down to the tip of South America all the way across the, the world. And then there's, there, there are giant sea migrations that uh, whales and dolphins do, where they move through the ocean, and tortoises, big sea turtles do huge sea migrations. So migratory behaviors are beneficial because if you get out of one spot, you're not going to use up your food. See, the, the caribou eating in one part of Canada, well, they eat little lichens and things that are very slow growing. If they stay in the same area, they're only going to run out of food. So they migrate to a new area and eat there while these lichens grow back. And then they migrate back and eat here, and then migrate over there and eat there. You see? No. Some migrations take them, they, uh, the tortoise, the, uh, the whales will migrate to an area that's good for having babies and they have all their babies there, and then they leave. And the babies have plenty of food and don't have to compete with the adults for food. We have a lot of, this is a popular spot for things to migrate. We have some of the shark breeding waters, biggest in the world, because we have these marshes, and we have these huge tides that pull a lot of water up into the marsh, and then pull a lot of water out of it, and it takes a lot of nutrients and food and, and little babies in and out of the marshes, and so there's a lot to eat for the babies. So because we have so much marsh in, in southeast Georgia, we have some of the prime breeding grounds and egg laying grounds for mammals and fish. Yeah? I did have a question earlier about the yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I just that kept talking. Mr. Yeah. Willis? Sometimes I just start going and can't Would you consider, like, if you have, like, two homes, one in, like, say, Kentucky and one in, like, Texas, and like during school? <laughs> Probably so not called migrating, but I mean, you can think about it the same way. But migrating is usually a huge population. Wait, what was the question? The humans moving from one place to another, is that the same as migration? Not really, because it takes whole populations. Snowbirds. Um. <coughs> This was showing, uh, oh, circadian rhythms. A circadian rhythm is a 24-hour rhythm. Humans have a circadian rhythm. Do you know what it is? Every 24 hours, something happens. We get sleep. You go to sleep. And it just goes over and over every 24 hours. Every 15 hours. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, every day, it's, it's, you fall asleep about the same time every evening. And... Lots of animals have this in response to day and night. This shows the activity of squirrels. The green line means they're active. These squirrels are active at night. 
And then, uh, is it, was it squirrels? It's a cat, sir, sir, Katie. Okay. Uh, no, yeah, squirrels. Yeah. So they're yeah. active yeah. at night yeah. and then they're sleeping in the yeah. daytime. Yeah. And then what they did was they took the same squirrels and they just put them in dark conditions in a lab where there was no light. And it shows that they still basically keep up, even after 20 days, an activity of being active and then sleeping. Um, so at the beginning, they were just active around the same amount as they were before. And it kind of moves where it spreads out a little bit. But for the most part, they're, they still keep a 24-hour cycle, even though they're, they don't have the light and dark cues. Interesting experiment. They've done that with humans. They've what taken humans. That looks great. Listen. They've taken humans and put them in a mine where there's no light and dark. And they don't give them any clocks. And they don't tell them what time it is. And they just let them go to sleep whenever they want. Sophie, could you pay attention up here? And they measure to see, do the humans stay awake for 16 hours and sleep for 8 hours? Or do they go into some other cycle? if they don't know when it's light and when it's dark. And they found out for the most part, humans stay on a 24 hour cycle. It's like a 24 hour, 11 minute cycle, even if you don't know. Is it true that you can't hours. catch up on sleep? Like if, you, you, if you're <laughs> sleep deprived, No, that's, just, actually go ahead. Go ahead. Like if you're sleep deprived. I don't know if that's true. Because my mom's like, you can't, there's no such thing as catching up on sleep. Like, I didn't get much sleep one night, and then I slept, like, all day until, like, 2 the next day. Yeah. And then she, I was like, she goes, how are you still tired? Because I was yawning at, like, 8 o'clock. So you can get and she's like, there's no reason you can catch up on sleep. You can to some extent, I think, but maybe so not completely. Oh my god, Graham, was I talking to you? I don't think oh so. Oh my god, this is a good oh, question. Okay, oh. let's go so I can finish. Almost done. Communication. There's different types of communication. This <laughs> cheetah is communicating through pheromones. You might have noticed your dog does this. He goes out, you let him out, he goes and runs around and pees on everything. Have you ever thought, why doesn't he just pee one long pee and then get it over with and go about his day? Why just pee a little bit here and a little bit here and a little bit here? So it's because they have a scent gland next to their urethra that throws a little scent into the pee. And the scent lasts for days. And they're marking their territories. And so this cheetah, after it pees, he's saying, that's my territory and the scent will stay on the tree. And so another cheetah, if it comes up to the area, it'll smell the trees, and it'll smell the tree, and it'll go, oh, there's been already a cheetah here. This is not my territory. And this is why dogs, when you go walk your dog, he's peeing everywhere, and another dog runs up, and the first thing it does, it sniffs his butt. It's not sniffing his butt for, like, doo-doo smell. They don't care about that. It's sniffing his butt to see what his scent is. And then when he smells it, when, when that dog smells your dog's scent, it can remember in its head everywhere where it smelled the scent before, so it then knows where your dog's territory is. And they keep track of one another's territory really well because they have a huge part of their brain devoted to scent. And they can remember all the scents that they've smelled through their lives. And they can smell you, smell a scent, it's been shown, they can smell a scent 10 or 12 years later, a dog can, and remember it back from 10 or 12 years ago where the territory was and that sort of thing. How do, they, how, do you, how do the scientists know that? Is that how? Sophisticated experiments. I mean, it's, it's, you got to set up a, a condition where you get a reward when you recognize a smell. And you go, f when you recognize that smell, there is a reward present somewhere. And it's only for smells that they recognize. So when they do recognize the smell later, they run to, to get the reward because they know the reward's going to be there. So you realize that they can remember that scent even that morning. Like if you give a dog a treat after you stuff Yeah, kind of, yeah. If it smells a scent, it gets a reward. This is how they, that's how they train like dogs to find corpses and things like that. So if they correctly locate the scent, they get the reward. And they can even look, remember a scent years and like years in the future. Yeah, is that why they say like uh, dogs never forget their energy? 